Hey guys, welcome to Spec Transfer and to the first of two parts on topic 3.3.4.1 mass transport in animals from the AQA A level biology specification. In this series on mass transport in animals, we'll first give an introduction to haemoglobin. Then we'll move on to how exactly haemoglobin transports oxygen in the bloodstream, as well as the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. We'll then also look at the effect of carbon dioxide concentration on the dissociation of oxyhemoglobin, something which is known as the Bohr effect. Then we'll also look at the presence of different types of haemoglobin in animals living in different environments. In part two, we'll move on to the general pattern of blood circulation in a mammal. Then we'll have a look at the structure of the human heart as well as the pressure and volume changes and associated valve movements during the cardiac cycle. We also need to know the structure of arteries, arterioles and veins in relation to their function. Finally, we'll have a look at the structure of capillaries and the importance of capillary beds as exchange surfaces, as well as the formation of tissue fluid and its return to the circulatory system. So let's start off with an overview of haemoglobin, which can also be abbreviated as Hb. Haemoglobin is a large globular protein with a quaternary structure, meaning that it is made up of more than one polypeptide chain. In haemoglobin, it is four. For my video on proteins, just click the link top right. Each chain contains a heme Fe2 plus group, which binds to oxygen and therefore each haemoglobin molecule can hold up to four oxygen molecules. We can portray the reaction of oxygen binding to haemoglobin in an equation. So haemoglobin plus four oxygen molecules goes to HbO8, which is known as oxyhemoglobin. Note that this is a reversible reaction, so the equation can go both ways. The binding of oxygen to haemoglobin is known as loading, and the unbinding is known as unloading. The forward reaction, so the loading of oxygen, occurs in the lungs, and the backward reaction, which is the unloading of oxygen, occurs at the respiring tissues. So let's look at the transport of oxygen in the blood in a bit more detail. We need to know a few terms. The partial pressure of oxygen, also abbreviated as PO2, is a measure of the concentration of oxygen. The partial pressure of CO2, therefore, is a measure of the concentration of carbon dioxide. The partial pressure of oxygen is higher in the lungs and is lower at the respiring tissues. Note that haemoglobin's affinity for oxygen depends on the partial pressure of oxygen. Just to clarify, if haemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen, it means that oxygen binds easily to the heme groups in haemoglobin. Oxygen loads onto haemoglobin when there is a high partial pressure of oxygen and unloads from oxyhemoglobin when there is a low partial pressure of oxygen. This is very useful because it means that oxygen loads onto haemoglobin at the lungs and unloads at the respiring tissues. Next, we need to know the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Note that saturation is how much oxygen is being carried by haemoglobin and is expressed as a percentage. So the more saturated haemoglobin is, the more oxygen it is carrying. We need to be able to explain the shape of the curve. The joining of the first oxygen molecule is a bit more difficult and therefore slower, meaning that at first we have a slow increase in the percentage saturation of haemoglobin. However, the joining of the first oxygen molecule changes the shape of the haemoglobin, making it easier for other oxygen molecules to bind. This means that the percentage saturation of haemoglobin increases at a faster rate. 
However, it becomes more difficult for the fourth and last oxygen molecule to bind. So the rate in increase in percentage saturation of hemoglobin slows down. The oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve levels off at around 96%. Note that the partial pressure of CO2 also has an influence on the dissociation of oxyhemoglobin. A high partial pressure of carbon dioxide lowers hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen because it lowers the blood pH. This is an advantage because the rate of unloading of oxygen therefore increases at respiring cells, which produce carbon dioxide as a byproduct of respiration. Therefore, the faster the rate at which cells are respiring, the more oxygen is unloaded for a given partial pressure of oxygen. We can also portray this effect on our oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, which shifts to the right when we have a higher partial pressure of CO2. Hemoglobin overall has a lower affinity for oxygen and therefore hemoglobin is less saturated at a given partial pressure of oxygen. And this is known as the Bohr effect. Note that different organisms have different types of hemoglobin. These different types of hemoglobin may have different affinities for oxygen. For example, if an organism is very active or has a high metabolic rate, for example, to generate lots of heat energy due to a very high surface area to volume ratio, then the organism may have a type of hemoglobin which has a low affinity for oxygen. Therefore, oxygen unloads more readily so that there is more oxygen available for the increased rate of respiration. Hemoglobin is less saturated at a given partial pressure of oxygen and therefore our curve shifts to the right. Some organisms, on the other hand, may live in an environment with a low concentration of oxygen. For example, organisms living at high altitudes. These may have a type of hemoglobin which has a high affinity for oxygen, meaning that oxygen loads more readily. Therefore, hemoglobin is more saturated for a given partial pressure of oxygen, and our curve shifts towards the left. So in summary, we've given an introduction to hemoglobin, we've had a look at how hemoglobin transports oxygen in the bloodstream, we've looked at the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve as well as the effect of CO2 on the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen, as well as the presence of different types of hemoglobin in different organisms living in different environments. That would be it for now. Thanks guys for watching Spec Transfer. Please comment, subscribe, add any suggestions. To watch part two of mass transport in animals, just click on the video bottom left.